All right. Well, we are just after six o'clock, so we're going to go again started. Thank you, folks, for attending. I'm sure we'll have some more uh, coming in as we go here. But my name is Derek Heidman. I'm the Director of Collections and Research here at Old Surbridge Village. And I'm going to be joined tonight by our Curator of Textiles and Collections Manager, Rebecca Bell. Uh, we are both the co-authors of the new book, um, Needle and Thread, and we're excited to be talking to you tonight about the, the book through this webinar. Um, so just a couple of things about the webinar. So we will be recording this. You can check it out later if you can't actually be here for the entire webinar tonight. Uh, we would encourage you, though, to be entering any questions you have in the Q&A chat as we're going throughout the whole webinar here, just so you can uh, have your questions answered at the end of the webinar. Uh, we will also be including some information about how you can actually get your own copy of Needle and Thread that is now available here at the gift shops at OSV. Um, so with that, I'm going to actually hand it off to Rebecca, who is going to get us started. Thank you very much, and thank you all for attending. Um, so as Derek mentioned, this is uh, about our book that just came out, but really it has its inception with uh, one of our newer exhibits of the same title. And I have to say this exhibit came about for two reasons, one positive, one a little less so. Um, the first was back even before the pandemic, we'd started talking with interpretation about developing a program focusing on women's needle trades in particular and how we could bring that program out to the public. So we'd started doing a little bit of digging and one of my colleagues had found um, a resource that we have in our research library. And on the card catalog, all it said was L.H. Guernsey, Vermont. And so my colleague Jean Contino was trying to dig into who is L.H. Guernsey and learn a little bit more about her and couldn't find her anywhere. So uh, she called me over and we started pouring over this manuscript and comparing letters. And lo and behold, it wasn't an L.H., it was a Z.H. So with that information, Jean was able to track down Zerua. And that sort of started the whole idea of creating a program around women who are working in the needle trades to earn money for their family or extra money who had uh, an additional skill level or training or equipment that would allow them to work on more complicated tasks that maybe women who weren't in those needle trades might need a little bit of help with. So that was all in the background. We started talking about, wouldn't this be a great exhibit to complement the program that's going on interpretation, but we didn't really have the space. And then one of our buildings that housed a semi-permanent exhibit had an HVAC oopsie, um, the HVAC went completely down. So we had to deinstall that exhibit in very quick order to save the objects that were in there. And then we found ourselves with an empty building. We got the HVAC repaired, we refreshed the space, did painting and repairs as needed, and all of a sudden started rethinking about this exhibit in conjunction with the programs out in the, um, out in the village. So lo and behold, Needle and Thread was born. What we really wanted to do is tell a bigger story than just sewing the clothes or just the clothing that people wore. We wanted to really tell almost like the life cycle of the clothes from their creation through their wearing and all the way through maintenance and repair and what happens afterwards when the clothing is not functional anymore. But for me, beyond that, where the story really started was some people. Um, period quotes, again, that we have in our research library. We've got wonderful resources there. Uh, so in the next slide, you can see some of the inspiration quotes. The one at the top um, is from Lucy Larkham. I don't know if we can advance the, the slide there. Oh, there we go. So um, the one at the top was from Lucy Larkham, who in her 1889 book wrote, that um, I somehow or somewhere got the idea while I was a small child that the chief end of woman was to make clothes for mankind. This thought came over me with a sudden dread one Sabbath morning when I was a toddling thing, led along by my sister behind my father and mother. As they walked arm in arm before me, I lifted my eyes from my father's heels to his head and mused, how tall he is and how long his coat looks and how many thousand, thousand stitches there must be in his coat and pantaloons. And I suppose I've got to grow up and have a husband and put all those little stitches into his coat and pantaloons. Oh, I never, never can do it. A shiver of utter discouragement went through me. With that task before me, it hardly seemed as if life were worth living. So I have to say, I have a seven-year-old at home. So when I read this quote, I hear her voice in that very dramatic seven-year-old way. And this really started thinking, uh, we wanted to show that it is indeed a big job. And as you can see by the other quotes on the screen, 
it's throughout people's diaries and day books and this idea of making things but also repairing things and caring for them doing laundry and ironing is throughout the life and writings and diaries of early 19th century women. So it certainly was a big job, but Lucy wasn't entirely correct. It wasn't necessarily a job you had to do all on your own, that there was a network that you could go to, whether it's professionals or folks with skills like Zerua or calling on family members to help. Or in um, some cases, you might find uh, burgeoning ready-made clothes in urban areas that men are partaking of. So there is a bigger story. It's not just that women were making all of the clothing themselves. So with that in mind, too, we wanted to, um, on the next slide, show how broad the, the scope was for clothing a family. So today, we're used to having closets full of clothing, shirts and shirts and shirts and pants and any number of things. And when you think about the folks in the 19th century, certainly they didn't have necessarily dozens and dozens of dresses hanging up in a closet. Well, you might just have one or two dresses, a couple of pantaloons, a tailcoat or two, et cetera, et cetera. You still have to put that in context of the average family size. So in this area, New England, in our time period, the average, and of course that allows for some flexibility, some had larger families, some had smaller families, but the average was about five to six children. So you imagine clothing a family of seven or eight people, and you have your, your main garments, your dress, your gown, your coat, your pantaloons, but also your undergarments. So petticoats, shifts, uh, stays, stockings, men's shirts. Then you've got your, your coats, your vests, your, your pantaloons and trousers, your garments, your gowns. And then on top of that, you might have accessories. So it's really a very broad number of clothing and types of clothing that you would need uh, for clothing a family. And that's not even considering in New England, we have seasons. So you're going to have some clothing that would be suitable for spring and summer, and then some clothing that would be suitable for the cooler weather, fall and winter. So really, it's a very broad clothing a family um, broad task, but at the same time, they did not necessarily have quite as many individual items as we did. So it's, it's kind of an interesting uh, dichotomy there. So the other thing we wanted to show is, as I said earlier, the life cycle of the clothing. So in the next slide, one of the things that I loved about the exhibit is that not only did we get to show actual garments, but we actually got to bring out some very utilitarian things from our collection that you would see in storage and they look, oh, irons, a washing machine, a, a sewing basket. But once you get them into the exhibit and put them in context, they become very, very interesting and special. So it's also interesting to uh, note throughout the advice books, importance of laundering your clothing, ironing your clothing, mending your clothing. And advice authors like Lydia Mariah Child and Catherine Beecher would recommend, you know, you should attend to the mending at least once a week or, you know, take care of your laundry once a week and make sure that as you're laundering your clothes, you're you're going through and making sure you darn any stockings that have holes in them or patch any tears before they get too bad. So really, we live in a very disposable society. And I know I'm very guilty of this. Buying things in the minute it gets a little hole, you throw it out, you buy a new one. It's not terribly expensive in most cases. But folks in the 19th century were not necessarily thinking about that. They were thinking about the longevity of clothing, either mending it and repairing it so that it lasts longer or also altering it. So as styles are changing, keeping up with some of the later styles by altering garments that were pre-existing and getting a little more life out of them. So beyond the life cycle of the clothing from creation through wearing to maintenance, we also wanted to show that contrary to Lucy's belief that all of this was done at home, that there was a broad network of resources that folks could draw on. So in the next slide, we've got some, um, some inspiration, some uh, advice books, the Workwoman's Guide, which hopefully will come up soon. Oh, there we go. Um, so we've got advice books like the Workwoman's Guide, which was published in 1838 in London. And as you can see, it's just full of not only advice, but patterns, patterns for bodices and sleeves, patterns for shirt fronts and undergarments like petticoats and uh, shifts and stays. 
So this is not necessarily something that everybody would have access to, but certainly it's one method for folks to um, get some assistance, get some additional resources. On the other side, we've got some wonderful fashion plates. We've got some great um, periodicals in our research library like Godey's and the Ladies Pocket Magazine. And of course, looking at these fashion plates, they are very uh, Eurocentric. A lot of them are coming out of uh, places, urban places like Paris and London. So certainly representing uh, a higher style than you might find in a lot of rural areas. But it's really amazing to see how quickly the styles are going from the urban centers and migrating out to the more rural areas. And like today, people are finding themselves on a fashion continuum. So you might be exposed to some of these newer styles and say, well, that look as it is, is not practical for me in my current life and what I need to do. But I love that sleeve style or that bodice style or the cut of that vest. So you might find folks incorporating little details from these advice books or from the fashion plates. And of course, you also have the professionals who are aware of the styles. So people might be taking uh, advice from the professionals. In fact, one, a Mesa Walker in uh, the Brookfields was recollecting as a young boy getting a new garment made and going to a tailoress, Aunt Debbie, and consulting her not only about the construction of the garment, but asking her advice on what collar should it have, what style should it have, what cut should it have. So these professionals are sort of in that realm of knowing about some of the, the newer styles and maybe being able to help folks adopt as they, as they like some of those newer styles. So in the next slide, we show a little bit more about the different ways that folks might be going about working with uh, professionals. So you have people like Zerua, who seems to be doing fairly um, sort of middle of the road work. She's working on a lot of construction, helping people with dresses and whatnot. So at a, a step above maybe simple sewing um, that you might be doing in the house and using her skills, primarily it seems within the community um, as Aunt Debbie was. So throughout her book that we have in that lower corner there, she's got lists of who she's working with, what she's doing for them, what she's doing, um, or how much she's charging rather. And at the back, she's got lists of what she's pur purchasing, all of her supplies, fabrics that she's purchasing. So it's a really interesting document. Above, we have William Kate, who is a tailor in Salisbury, New Hampshire. And what's really interesting about his book is it shows that customers are coming back to him time and time again. So he was working from the early 1800s into the 1830s, so decades long, and folks are coming back to him year after year, decade after decade, in a lot of case, cases, excuse me. He is doing a variety of things from sewing things, but also he mentions a lot of cutting out um, garments for people and presumably he's cutting them out and then at home they could be stitched together. So that's that's another option. The bonnet in the center, uh, millinery of course is a, a big uh, skill. And this one is a bonnet from Mrs. P. Hinckley who is active in Hartford, Connecticut. And again, she was active for quite a long time. This bonnet is circa 1830. Another thing that's happening in terms of professional uh, sewing and the availability of ready-made clothing is that there are starting to be um, warehouses, and you can see an advertisement here for that, where people, primarily men, uh, not necessarily women, are partaking of ready-made clothing, things like shirts and vests and uh, things like that, pantaloons. So there are lots and lots of options for folks beyond the little Lucy's idea of everything has to be has to be sewn at home. So that's the the basic story um, that we wanted to tell with the exhibit and then translate that into the book. I have to say, I believe the next slide is a picture of the actual um, exhibit as it's finished. It's not a very large space. So built into this exhibit, we wanted to make sure that we left plenty of time for rotation. So the exhibit itself will be up for at least a few more years. But obviously the textiles are very sensitive, so we cannot keep those in uh, as they are for that many years. And so we are planning on multiple rotations, which you'll see reflected in the book. You'll see some things that are in the uh, exhibit now that are reflected in the book. But as you come back, we're hoping to put more things that are in the book on display in the exhibit particularly as our, our next change is coming, hopefully this fall, uh, putting in rather than lighter weight clothing as we've got here, 
putting in some winter garments. So we might put in uh, one of my favorites, uh, wool shelly uh, gown. So definitely look for additional changes in this space. And we're going to try and tie back into the book so that folks get a chance to see in person some of these wonderful garments that we have in our collection. And I have to say, uh, before I turn it back over to Derek, that we have a really wonderful collection and it's been a privilege to work with it. In particular, our research library is a fabulous resource with manuscripts and published primary sources from our period. Our textile collection is fantastic. We've got uh, about 7,000 textile objects, including the garments that you see, but also going into domestic textiles, quilts, samplers, um, a little bit of anything you can think of we have in our collection. So we're really pleased to be able to not only show our collection through the exhibits, as you see on the screen, but also through hopefully publications and more publications like the book. So with that, I will turn it on over to Derek. Thank you, Rebecca. All right, we'll go to the next slide here. So we want to talk a little bit about kind of the process and, and why it is that we decided to do the book at the time that we did. So, um, you know, like Rebecca had said, we were already working on this great exhibit, Needle and Thread, about clothing the early 19th century family. Um, and there were a few different things that, that really made this seem like the ideal time for us to get back into publications about our collection. Hold on, we're having some issues with the images actually advancing because they are so large. <laughs> Okay, it appears that it's frozen. Well, I'll just keep on talking. Um, so one thing was that we actually had reinvested in photography for the museum. So years ago, we did actually have several photographers that were working at the museum um, that would be photographing not only out in, in the, the museum um, and all the living history exhibits and things that were happening here, but they were also photographing the collections objects that we have. And that's important for a record keeping perspective for us here at the museum. Um, but it's also just important for increasing access and, and being able to share these different images of different pieces that we have. So back in 2021, we received a grant uh, from the Bridge Street Foundation to buy a whole bunch of photography equipment and we had a contractor come out to teach our staff so we could actually do all of the photography ourselves in-house. So that was one thing when thinking about a book around the collection, around the textiles in particular, you know, we really, we knew we would have an, all, an awful lot of images in there and that would be an awfully pricey thing to do if we were hiring an external photographer to help out. Um, so we, here we go. Um, so we did end up investing in the staff time and have now been doing a lot of photography, not just for this book, but just, going through and, and doing a lot of record keeping for the collection um, and to share a lot of this online through webinars like this, through our online database um, as much as we possibly can. So the photography was really a critical part of the process. Um, another part of it too was our ability to really mount the garments in a way that, that we viewed as appropriate um, for a publication or high enough quality. So you can see here, uh, Rebecca, one of our interns and one of our fellows working on mounting a couple different pieces here. Uh, we had a conservator come out last year to work with us on building mounts um, for particular garments because although it might seem like you could just take a garment, put it on a mannequin and just kind of stuff it out a little bit, it doesn't, it doesn't quite replicate the form of the person that really wore it, right? So we decided that we were going to, um, again, invest in this skill set. And so Rebecca and others here at the museum have been doing an excellent job of developing these mounts. So with that, we've been able to do some really high quality photography. So here is a great example here um, that shows one of the earlier images. And nothing against this, this is a perfectly good image that shows us what this tailcoat looked like in our collection 30, 40 years ago. Um, but, you know, for the purpose of including things in the book and just getting more onto our website, you know, you can see the difference in how the tailcoat is mounted in the image at center here and the image at right. Um, it gives you much more of a sense of the shape of the garment, both in terms of the actual person that wore it and kind of their, their body shape, but also all of the actual sculpting of the piece. You can see how the sleeves actually fall. Um, you can see the flare and the cuffs. You can see how full the breast was and how high the collar was, um, which you don't really get that impression from the image all the way it left. So it really helped us quite a bit in, in kind of, you know, reimagining how these things would have truly looked and giving a truer uh, depiction of how these things would have looked in the time period on the people that really wore them. So along with that, we also, in conjunction with our historical clothing office, we're doing an awful lot of work on going back to the patterns that all of our clothing that our interpreters here at the museum that work out there in front of the public every day, um, the, the clothing they actually wear. Um, and over the years, although most of what they wear out in the museum is based on objects that we have in the textile collection, 
eventually it, it's like a game of telephone. Eventually things start to translate differently to different dressmakers or whatever it might be. And the patterns might have been modified for a particular staff person. And so we decided that we wanted to go back um, and reassess a lot of those patterns and see if there were any details that had been lost over you know, 40, 50 years of those patterns being used um, and also just reintroduce some new patterns. So again, just really kind of dedicating the time to getting more of our collection out in front of the public in a recreated sense that they can gain more of a sense of how this clothing actually was worn and, and behaved on a daily basis. So those things, again, were all kind of coming together and we were developing an idea for a whole bunch of publications we would like to do, this really being the first one. Um, and so now we're trying to develop our plan going forward for what we might be able to do for additional publications based around the collection of research library holdings. And so we kind of came up with this formula here. Um, the first thing is, of course, OSV, our emphasis is 1790 to 1840, and really the emphasis on the everyday. That's one thing that really allows our, our museum to relate so much to our guests because everyone coming to our museum is an everyday person, right? So we can clearly relate to their everyday lives and the clothing they wear today, things like that um, in the case of this book. Um, we wanted to harness the collection, the research library and get lots of great images, detail shots of the different um, you know, objects that we have or holding the library into the publications. And then of course, OSV has always been known for its craft program, really since the beginning of the museum. And that kind of interactive component of the book was really important to us. So at the back of the book, there's a half dozen patterns of a series of garments that are included or accessories that are included in the book that we specifically chose because they're not things you can easily get commercial patterns for today. If you go to you know, a website that sells all sorts, all sorts of kind of costume patterns of the past. Um, so including things like a suspender, something that seems very ordinary, um, but there really aren't a whole lot of those types of patterns out there. So we wanna to try to kind of help people throughout this process of recreating the clothing, uh, whether they're trying to do it in terms of making a really good reproduction or just using, using the objects and the patterns as inspiration for something they might create that, that is more of an everyday garment for today. Um, so we really want there to be that kind of past present connection as well with these publications going forward. So getting back specifically to needle and thread, what we decided would be the best thing to do is, is to base it around people, right? So we started with kind of framing the whole discussion of clothing in the early 19th century around this family, that the Tuttle family from Stratford, New Hampshire. Um, this depicts uh, Enoch Tuttle, who is a farmer, um, his wife, Hannah, and their two boys, James and Darius, um, who are depicted here. Also their cat, you can see in the middle right there. It's kind of a funny little detail. Um, but we thought this would be a good way to frame it around the actual people themselves that wearing the clothing in, in the 1830s. Now, this was painted in 1836 by Joseph A. Davis. Uh, and clearly, as you can see from looking at the clothing they're wearing, they're wearing their nicest clothing. You know, they're, they're wearing, you know, in the case of Enoch, he's wearing his full black suit, um, a very fashionable style and cut for the time period. Hannah is wearing her own black gown with the full, full sleeves, um, her collar, her decorative apron, her ribbon or her hair, I mean, really done up very nicely. And even the boys are wearing these surtouts that appear to be made of some kind of almost orangey silk. Um, so they're dressed in, in this really nice clothing of the time period. So we use this as kind of a framing for what the ideals were in this, this Euro-American dominant style of fashion in the early 19th century in New England. Um, and then we use different garments throughout the book to really illustrate um, what more of the everyday garments would have truly looked like in the time period. So we did heavily lean on our own collection for the book, but we did have to go outside. Initially, we were like, oh, this will be great. We can just focus on the OSV collection because it is incredibly rich. And we have thousands of garments and accessories in our textile collection. Um, and then that's, you know, there's all sorts of things in the research library as well that relate to clothing, um, but there were just some things that we were missing. And so we did look outside. So you can see here at the left-hand corner, we have Henry Tyler's advertisement um, for his new and secondhand clothing store in Boston. Um, Henry Tyler was a man of color living in Boston the time period um, who seemed to have a thriving business um, in, in the ready-made clothing industry, which is really emerging as Rebecca was saying earlier in this time period. And it does appear that a lot of the scholarly research coming out recently is showing that people of color were very heavily involved in the growth of that industry in the time period, especially in places like Boston and other cities. Uh, and so we wanted to include some of those stories. So Henry Tyler 
puts his advertisement in the American Traveler uh, newspaper in 1835, um, talking about selling all these sorts of things. He then goes on to actually have a patent, he says, um, not sure if it was actually a patent or not, but for basically a process of refurbishing clothing. So he's selling secondhand things. He's, he's taking in secondhand clothing that people bring in. Maybe it's their favorite coat that they accidentally dribbled tobacco juice onto or something like that, or their pipe accidentally, you know, got some ashes onto it and burned a little bit of a hole. Um, they might want to have that fixed up. So he's doing mending, he's doing over dyeing, all sorts of things to basically revitalize garments as well. Um, and unfortunately, we didn't actually have an advertisement of Henry Tyler's here in our collection of newspapers, which is pretty vast, but still didn't actually have one. So we did have to go to the American Antiquarian Society to get some help there. Um, we also, if you look to the far right of the screen, can see we have a suspender that's featured in the book. This is a really excellent example of an everyday suspender. Uh, we do have lots of suspenders in the collection that are made out of silk and very heavily embroidered, but that's clearly not what a farmer like the one depicted in this William City Mount painting um, is going to be wearing out in the fields, right, or out mucking out stalls, whatever it might be. This is a great example of an everyday suspender made out of a cotton webbing uh, with a decorative stripe woven into it um, and some leather attachment tabs to adjust the length on it. So we actually have here in this image that's included in the book as well, um, the Untruant Boys um, is the name of the painting, and it shows basically these three boys who are gambling in a barn while this father is coming around the corner and be like, what are you boys doing? Um, you can see the switch in his hand there, um, but you can clearly see because of the way he's dressed for the work he's doing exactly what his suspenders look like, and you see this quite a bit in Mount's paintings, um, and the New York Historical Society was generous enough to allow us to include this in the book so you can see that great detail uh, of what that suspender looks like, just to give some of the context. Again, we just didn't have a good example and our own collection here at OSV. So we'll talk a little bit about some of the garments that we included and why, um, because it was really hard, to be completely honest, to choose what garments would go into the book. Um, initially, when Rebecca and I started talking with a variety of other staff here at the museum and our communications department um, and other, other staff, we were like, we'll just do like, a, I don't know, maybe it'll be like 40 pages. And then it was 64 pages. And then eventually it went up to, I think we're up to 120 pages of the final publication. There was just so much to include. And we wanted to make sure that there were lots of detailed shots to show some of why these things are important to include. So this vest is one that did make it into the book. Um, and the reason that I included this one is I find this to be a really great example of not just an everyday vest that I firmly believe was made within the home, um, but also one that has responded to changes in fashion over time. So if we look at the left-hand image, we can see what this vest basically was cut to look like in terms of, of the style and the cut. Um, it was probably made in the mid-1820s um, when these, these kind of standing collars you see here were, were still quite common. They're starting to go out of fashion by the end of the 1820s um, to some extent. Um, but you can see it buttons all the way up the front with these mother of pearl buttons. Um, the back of it is a single piece of linen. Um, the fronts here are made out of a striped cotton and wool mixture. Um, what's really neat about this in terms of some of the details is actually only one of the pockets is functional. So the one on the left, um, sorry, the right breast, so the proper right breast is actually functional. The one on the left is basically just a sham pocket. So it's it's a welt that's sewn down to look like there's a pocket there, but they never actually installed a pocket bag. So saving a little bit of, of time in the production of the vests. Um, another detail, which you can see probably a little bit better in the image on the right hand side is the buttonholes. The buttonholes are actually different colors depending on which buttonhole it is and which stripe it actually goes through. So if it's going through the green and black stripe, it's actually a green thread. Um, if it's going through the more of the kind of cream colored stripe, it's more of a yellowish thread. And the buttonholes are worked fairly crudely, um, which again, doesn't seem like the kind of work that a tailor would do, or honestly, even an experienced sewer working at home. So this makes you wonder if this might've been something that was made by a younger member of the family who's learning to sew um, and kind of working through some of the, the, the details here. The buttonholes are also spaced um, differently. So depending on, they wanted the, the buttonholes to actually be cut through the center of a stripe one way or another. And so in some cases, there's a difference of up to a quarter of an inch with how they're actually placed. But to us looking at this right now, you can't really see that detail um, unless you actually get up really close and of course measure it with, uh, with a tape measure, which I'm sure no one was doing in the time period. Um, the last detail about this vest that I find to be I think the coolest thing about it is how it was modified. So you can see looking at the best pictures here, in one case, the collar is standing up as it was initially cut. Um, but the image on the right hand side shows it as it was actually modified 
probably sometime in the 1830s. Um, in that time period, vest styles start to change. You start to see more of these folded collars with either a notch or a shawl, this kind of nice rounded collar um, coming around, which would then expose your pleated front shirt with all the decorative ruffles and pleats in it. Your cravat would be standing proud on it. Um, and it also does give you more of that illusion of a broader chest, which was very fashionable for a man in the time period. Um, and so what the owner of this vest did to update it and make it a little bit more fashionable was they basically just started wearing it with the collar folded down. And we see lots of image of this in paintings in the time period, just in kind of everyday circumstances, um, kind of for comfort, it seems in some ways, but in some cases, it seems to be done for fashionable reasons as well. And one thing you can just barely make out in the image here is down where the roll actually is, where the collar folds over, it's actually held down with these two bar tacks right here. So clearly, again, it wasn't meant to have a roll like a collar would that actually did fold over the way it was cut initially. Um, and so someone in the family or potentially the owner itself had actually stitched these little, these little tacks into it to fold the collar over and keep it in that, that fashionable style they wanted to. But clearly, again, it, it wasn't meant to be worn this way based on all the piecing inside the collar and the fact the inside the collar here at the center back is lined with just the same linen as the back. Um, so a, a really neat garment that shows some modification over time. And we have lots of these garments in the collection that have been modified in these sorts of ways, um, depending on new tastes and fashions and things like that. So this was, was one we decided to include for that reason. Um, another thing that was included in the book was a sampling of handkerchiefs here. Now, these would have been worn by both men and women in the time period, um, but I wanted to include this just to kind of give a sense of the color and the variety that were worn on a daily basis. So everything from the yellow silk uh, resist dyed uh, handkerchief here that was likely coming from India in the time period to the woven cotton and linen examples, the black silk example, and then the printed cotton one most likely being made overseas in Great Britain and sent into the the American market. Um, just to, again, give you a sense of, you know, I think when we often think of clothing of the past, we think of kind of drab colors, right? We think of, of black and blue and brown, and, and that's about it, maybe white for the collars and, and things like that. But there was quite a bit of color, especially um, with the burgeoning textile industry in the time period, people are really integrating a lot of color into their dress on a daily basis. And I think this spread of handkerchiefs really, really shows that well. So with that, I'll turn over to you, Rebecca. So now you get to see some of my favorites from the book. Um, as Derek mentioned, we really wanted to center this around people. Um, and a lot of the garments that we did end up choosing, we chose because we knew who wore them. This little skeleton suit uh, was worn by Tristram Little of Hampstead, New Hampshire. He was born in 1818. So he's probably wearing this around 1820, 1821. It's fairly petite. This might have been the first uh, suit of clothing that a little boy was transitioned into after wearing a gown from birth. Um, and in a process called breaching is a, a little boy is being put into trousers or pants for the first time, usually happening after uh, a little one has been potty trained and can, as you can see, manage all the buttons that are on this garment. There are buttons attaching the, the top to the, the trousers and buttons up the back there to close it. So you can imagine a little one uh, needing to use the restroom and having trouble trying to get all of these buttons undone. And that's just a recipe for disaster. But what I also love about this one, uh, as Derek was talking about with the handkerchiefs, the bright red is wonderful. It is a scarlet wool a little skeleton suit. Another thing that I find really compelling, as with so many kids' clothes, it has been worn and worn to the point where it's got large patches on the knees. There is a patch on the seat of the trousers. It's got men's everywhere. So clearly this is a garment that was worn and uh, abused by uh, the children or the child who wore it. What's also really interesting, the more we look at some of these clothes and we're looking into how they were constructed and how they were lined and if the buttons were moved and whatnot, this one, if you look really carefully at the two cuffs on the sleeves, one is a very decidedly different size than the other. And we've poured over this garment and we can't figure out, is it in the process of being let out for somebody else or as the child grew, or is it being taken up for maybe the next uh, little boy in line to wear this garment? So it, it feels like it's in this process of transitioning from one size to the next, but we can't really quite make out if it's getting enlarged or getting taken down. And I think that's an important thing to think about, too, in terms of the life cycle of the clothing. A lot of these, especially for children, were designed to be very flexible. Uh, a lot of the gowns, especially early on for infants and the younger uh, kind of toddler and below, 
had a lot of drawstring closures. So very easy to adjust, um, not only as the child grew, but also then passing it on to the next child down the line. Um, as they get into the sort of young child and older child, you find that less and less and more um, more traditional closures like the buttons or hooks and eyes on the, the little girl's dresses. Um, but you also find a lot of things like growth tucks or extra fabric that's been left in the skirt so you can lengthen the skirt or clever ways that you can adjust the, the children's garments, again, to make them last a little longer because kids grow very, very quickly, but then also to uh, have that ability to pass them on down the line to either other siblings or other relatives or keep passing them down. So this one was a, a really fun one to include. And the next one in line, I believe, is one of our ladies' gowns, if we can get the slide to advance. Uh, As Derek said, we took head. some really fantastic <laughs> pictures, and uh, the file size, therefore, is quite large, so that's probably slowing us down a little bit. Is it advancing? It's, it's struggling at the moment, but we'll oh, get there. No. We'll get there. <laughs> So this gown, when it does pop up on the screen, is really one of my favorites for a few different reasons. It is a, just a wonderful pattern, a wonderful um, bodice, very flattering with uh, pleating at the top. And as we're going through the workman's guide, there is a pattern very similar, if not exact, for a bodice just like this one. There it is. Um, so in the book, we do have this dress and the bodice close up with that plate from the workman's guide, which is really interesting. So again, reinforcing that there are ways that women could be uh, incorporating some of these new styles, utilizing uh, sources like the workman's guide or advice books. Another really neat thing about this dress, uh, it's dated to 1832, and we know that in large part because as part of our collection, we also have a swatch book from the Fall River Print Works, and it's dated at the front 1832. Uh, this was uh, a swatch book that was sent to dry goods sellers in Lowell, Massachusetts. And there's a notation in the front saying they uh, purchased 450 yards of various um, fabrics from this particular uh, sample book. So it's really interesting to see how uh, the fabrics are migrating out and the different patterns and colors and as Derek alluded to, the fact that, that there's just uh, an explosion of color and pattern. And what I love about some of the patterns in the sample book and on this dress is it's layers of patterns. So you've got the, the flowers in the foreground. And if you look really closely, there's a texture and a pattern to the background as well. So really, really detailed prints. It's also kind of a, an interesting way to start thinking about northern textile mills and you know how we in the north are benefiting from slavery in the South. So we right now in the 1830s and 40s are in the midst of the Industrial Revolution. There are textile mills all over New England, uh, Sturbridge, Massachusetts, Lowell, up and down New England. And there's a huge drop in the price of textiles, particularly printed cottons like this one, down from, you know, a dollar or more yard a couple of generations ago, down to just you know, 10 cents a yard and a huge demand then in these northern textile mills for cotton. And of course, where is that cotton coming from? But the southern plantations at the expense of the enslaved men, women and children who are really working under forced, horrific conditions. And so I think this in a very visceral way shows how much the North is implicit and complicit in uh, the whole southern uh, institution of slavery and it kind of it's it's really interesting to think as we're going through all of these gowns and these wonderful cotton prints how they came to be and whose backs they were literally made on and I think that has a lot of um, sort of relevance today as we're thinking about fast fashion and where are materials that we have today coming from and who's making our clothes and what conditions are they working under. So, you know, it was kind of a sobering thought to be putting hands on some of these garments and realize where they're coming from and who's responsible for bringing these garments out. So that was, you know, an interesting thing um, and something that we definitely wanted to address in the book as well and kind of not only put it in context there, but also the whole textile industry and labor laws and child labor and the conditions of the, the Northern textile mills too. Um, so we've come a long way in terms of wages and, and child labor and things like that, that definitely folks were, were dealing with in the 19th century. So the next, uh, the next gown is another ladies gown kind of switching gears. 
Um, this one is the wool one that I mentioned earlier. It's a really fabulous uh, gown. It's one of those moments where when I was first looking through the collection, I, I have to admit this was not my favorite. I took a look uh, at the gown on the hanger and did not have the best reaction to the fabric. It's very interesting. It's very geometric and graphic, um, but not necessarily what I had in mind as a 19th century uh, fabric and pattern. But the more I looked at it and the more I sort of studied it, it really, it grows on you. So now it's become one of my favorite gowns. And I think in large part, when we put it on a mannequin and got it onto a, a body shape and it really brought out some of the beautiful pleating in the bodice and the pleating at the shoulders that matches, uh, excuse me, the pleating at the cuffs. So it really came alive, uh, for lack of a better way to put it, on the form as we're taking photography and taking pictures of it. The other really interesting thing about this one is that it has a matching cape, as you can see in the picture on the right, and it goes and changes the look of this garment completely. So without the cape, it's got a beautiful neckline just hitting slightly off the shoulder. And then when you put the cape on, it covers up all that beautiful detail on the bodice and the upper shoulders, and it becomes a much more um, constrained, I guess would be a good word for it, a much... Um, a, missing the words here, but definitely a, a different look, an entirely different look with just the addition of one accessory. Um, what we did throughout the book is we wanted to really highlight some details that were interesting to us. So uh, in this particular case, we definitely wanted to highlight the beautiful um, pleating at the shoulders, the bodice, the, the cuffs, but also the beautiful piping. So what might not be showing very clearly in the slide, but hopefully we captured in the book is most of this dress at the edge of the cape, the edge of the plackets on the that's holding down the pleating and the edge of the cuffs, beautiful piping in a contrasting, slightly contrasting silk. So it really gives a lovely polish and finish to this dress as well. So this is one that I'm definitely hoping to be able to put on exhibit um, in the fall when we do our changeover. Um, another thing we really wanted to do in the book is we wanted to, because when you see an exhibit and you see the garments beautifully mounted, you see the exterior. We really wanted to show folks the, the guts of some of these. So we definitely took some shots and put them in the book of the linings or details on the inside that you might not necessarily get a chance to see um, by looking at the piece in person uh, in an exhibit. So. This was really a, a fun dress to, to talk about. The next garment uh, kind of relates back to the Tuttle family and the, the two little boys wearing their lovely orange surtouts. This happens to be a child's, a girl's dress. Um, again, a little bit older than the little skeleton suit that we saw earlier, but it is the most glorious orange silk. It is a figured silk. It is beautiful. Um, again, circa 1830 or so. And you might be able to see it in the bottom image there, again, with the piping, a contrasting yellowy orange silk piping that really accentuates the detail in the bodice um, and the detail it's around the shoulders and around the cuffs. So it's really, it's a beautifully constructed little dress. What I love about this, and because I have a seven-year-old at home who is notoriously squirmy, I've never seen this on another garment yet, but if you look at the back, the hooks and eyes are set opposite one another. So one hook corresponds to one eye and on the next one down, the eye is on the opposite side, the hook is on the opposite side. So as we're putting the mannequin, uh, putting the dress onto the mannequin rather, it was quite difficult to get all those nicely hooked, but man, once we got them hooked, they were staying put. So I can only imagine, and this is complete supposition on my part, that this is uh, somebody's attempt to maybe keep a little one, a squirmy little one in her garment and not squirming out of it and not losing the hooks and eyes. But again, a really interesting detail that on the mannequin you would not necessarily get a chance to see. So we were really glad to be able to, to show that. And I think I've got one more. Yes, my, my okay, this is my favorite, my absolute favorite. I know I've said that a lot. This is a milkweed tippet. Um, this one is currently on display. And that's the garment on the left-hand side of the screen. It is beautifully lined with yellow silk. It is, it looks like fur. It's actually milkweed, which is really wonderful. It was made by a member of the Pomfret, uh, the Trowbridge family rather of Pomfret, Connecticut uh, in 1828. And what's really special is that we also have a cape, which is on the right-hand side from the same family, the same time, same materials, uh, just happens to be lined with green silk instead. The tippet is in 
exquisite condition. As you can see from the pictures, the cape is a little bit more worn, but what's really wonderful, especially about the cape is because it's so worn, you can actually see how it's been constructed and put together. So using milkweed uh, to construct garments was somewhat of a fad in the 1820s, 30s, and 40s. Um, you do see them, uh, garments popping up at agricultural fairs and such. And it is definitely a very labor intensive process. You have to collect the milkweed at just the right point so that it's not uh, too dry, too late, or not opened up enough too early. And then sew those milkweed fibers into little tiny tufts or bundles. You take those bundles and then almost like shingling a roof, sew them onto a base fabric, overlapping a little bit with each row so that you're covering up your stitching. And the overall effect is just beautiful. It's got a sheen to it. It looks very much like an elegant fur. And it is that kind of object that makes you just want to, to touch it because it looks so, so soft. Um, but you can really see how it's constructed in the uh, unfortunate condition of the cape over there. So that's really a wonderful, even though it is in fragile condition, it's a really wonderful resource for us. So this one, you can imagine the wearer just being very proud of her accomplishment um, in making this and spending all that time and labor to make this beautiful, beautiful garment. So that is one of the things I think that's really unique and special in our collection. There are a few other collections that have them in existence, but they don't appear to be uh, super widespread and they are fairly delicate. So the fact that we can put this out on exhibit for a little while and put it into the book and show it off to folks is really, really exciting for us. And I think that brings us to the last garment. Yes. So like we had said, we, we really debated a lot of the garments that went into the book and we struggled so much to figure out exactly what we'd like to include. But there was one garment that we, we both agreed we would have loved to include it if we could. And that is this one right here. So it's actually, it's a whole ensemble, I guess, for an infant. Um, when Rebecca and I first saw this in the collection, we instantly thought first child, you know? I mean, to, to go through the effort of making a coat, this this frock coat is literally cut exactly the same as a man's very fashionable fail, tail coat, or sorry, not tail coat, frock coat uh, of the late 1820s. Um, and it even has, you know, the little, the little silk faux vest that goes on the front of it there. I mean, it is, it is a ton of work that went into this tiny, tiny little garment. And I would say the full length, this is probably about 15 inches, just to give you a sense of the scale. Um, it's absolutely tiny. And we found out through researching it that um, the coat was actually worn by William Henry Scarry, um, who had a family who or, or had a, a family member who was a tailor who actually made this for him. Um, and he wore it when he was three days old in 1827. So typically, you know, when a child is that young, they're basically just wearing a dress um, that looks very much kind of like a, a, a man's shirt or a shift almost. Um, they weren't really going into tailored garments, but the fact that the tailor who was a, a fam family member um, in North Brookfield just down the road made this is, is really, um, just really interesting. It makes you wonder so much about the family dynamics um, and, and why, you know, this was made for the child. So just a really, really neat piece. Certainly a lot more things we would love to include in the book, um, but I guess that means we just need to do more. So, <laughs> so with that, I think we're going to actually open it up to any questions that people have. I know that some have been popping in here uh, as we go through, so I'll go ahead and open them up. Um, the first one we have is from Sam Cathy. So, his question is, my understanding is that in the 18th century, tailors and mantua makers made most all clothing. Women in home actually did very little clothing creation, mostly repair work. Here we are in the 1830s, and it seems women are much more responsible for creating clothing. When did the change occur, and possibly why did this change occur? That's a great question, Sam. I'm not sure if you have any initial thoughts, Rebecca. I can certainly jump in, but... Yeah, a couple. I mean, I think one of the things that we see in the 1830s is a change in styles, which I think lends itself to some garments being much easier for folks, or not necessarily much easier, but something that folks at home could be capable of creating a lot of the structured tailor clothing uh, seems to be the type of clothing that you would definitely want to seek outside help for. So things like uh, the men's tailcoats or the, the fitted dresses and gowns um, that require a lot more, uh, a lot more care to get them to fit to the body in the proper way. Um, things like uh, 18th century stays versus the 19th century stays. The 19th century stays for us um, tend to be, again, fitted. Um, there are definitely patterns for them in the workman's guide. It's something that you might seek outside help for, but it also has a lot less boning and structure. Most of the sort of stiffness of the stays are from cording um, or that sort of 
it's supportive and stiffened, but it's not stiff like you might have a heavily boned corset or a pair of stays. So I think there's definitely a little bit of like changing styles or making it a little bit a little bit easier. But certainly in the early 19th century, folks are still seeking outside help for especially the more complicated garments, the more tailored garments. And I mean, like like Rebecca had mentioned earlier, another thing too that I think it's contributing is there's so much more advice literature out there to help people in making their own clothing at home. Um, whether it be something as simple as a shirt or a bonnet or a tailcoat or things like that. I mean, there's so many starting in the 1790s, especially there are so many tailoring manuals coming out. In some cases, designed really for other tailors to kind of you know spread their drafting methods and things like that. Um, but there's also some like the Amanda Jones one that's written in 1822, which is specifically designed Designed for clothing the family and for cutting men's clothes. Um, so there's there's just a lot more of that kind of advice literature that seems to be coming out. I mean, the Workman's Guide, another one that we've referenced here, great example of that, that takes all these seemingly complicated garments and makes them, um, or explains them in a way that, that is very clear cut in a lot of ways. Sometimes the Workman's Guide can be a little confusing, I'm not going to lie. And some of the drafting methods you'll see in those early tailoring manuals uh, are also a little a little out there um, in terms of the scientific principles they're trying to prove. But, but those, those are probably also additional factors that contribute. Uh, so our next question comes from Jennifer Jackson. She says, love the book. I hurried to the village to buy it as soon as it came out. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Um, question about the patterns in the back of the book. Would it be possible to show a finished object photographed on an interpreter or through these great photography skills you mentioned on your Instagram account to show the pattern and the actual object and also entice people to buy the book? That's a that's a great idea. We can certainly do that. Um, to be honest, some of the, the pieces we chose to go into the book Again, partly were because of what patterns we thought would be very useful to people who were looking to do reenacting of this time period. Um, but they were also things that we were already working on within that whole structure of reassessing patterns here at the museum uh, and also our sewing program here and showing the needle trades again. So things like the cape, um, the cap, those sorts of, even the skeleton suit um, were actually being patterned for the purpose of, of that kind of work in front of the public. Uh, but we can certainly try some of that. Maybe as we're getting closer to textile weekend or just as other projects come up that staff have completed, we can, we can try to do that. So that's, that's a great idea. Uh, our next question from Beth Houston. What other publications are you thinking of creating? Oh, Beth, we could we could talk. Rebecca and I were just talking yesterday. We talk pretty much every day about other publications we can do. Um, I mean, Rebecca, you want to talk about some of the ones you're thinking about? Mine are obviously very biased, so I keep sending Derek um, ideas for textile focused ones. Um, but a few I think that would be really fun to do uh, one on knitting. Um, we've got a number of different knit items in uh, the collection, stockings, mittens, yarn sewing. Um, so it would be really fun to do something like that. Also embroidery. We've got a wonderful collection of not only samplers, but other embroidered things, embroidered pockets, uh, embroidered garments, white work, cruel work. Um, so it would be really interesting, I think, to take a look at embroidery across the board and do different types of embroidery, not necessarily just samplers. We could fill a whole book with samplers for sure, but take a look at different types of embroidery and put some patterns in the back there. And those are just a, a couple off the top. But again, we could probably do an outerwear book or uh, another book just focused on clothing from the collection. So we've got lots of lots of textiles that remain untapped. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, the, the textile collection is just so vast. There's so much we can include. And we know, too, that a lot of our, our members and visitors really appreciate that part of the collection um, in particular, it seems. So so we would love to do more books around that. And we've also talked about other things like trying to uh, almost get new versions of books that we had done in the past. So, for instance, we did a book back in the 1960s that was a combination of the work of John Obed Curtis and William Guthman um, on New England militia uniforms and equipment. That's something I would love to take on as a project. Um, we've talked about doing something involving tinware, other trades, things like that, talking about music as well. Um, so any of those types of things where, again, we have a great reflection of those things in the collection. They relate to everyday life in the early 19th century, and there's an interactive component. That's the really critical thing, because we don't just want to show off this cool stuff, but we want all you to actually be able to engage with it in your own lives today. So, so yeah, so more to come on that. At this point, we, we don't know exactly when the next one is coming out um, and what it will be, but we're, we're planning more at this point. So Henry Cook did have one comment actually in talking about the dress, I believe the Wool Shall Lee one earlier, yes. um, just mentioning the fact that cape to the gown would add modesty to allow this stylish gown to be shown off while showing decorum at Sunday worship, which is, I mean, yes. dead on. Modesty was the word I was looking for, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> 
Okay, our next question, how how were the colored patterns created? Are they part of a weave pattern or are they painted on? Uh, I'm assuming that's that's relating to printed cottons, um, which was a, a block printing process. I'm not sure, Rebecca, if you want to talk about that, given that we do actually have some of that reflective in the exhibit. Sure, yeah. Um, the different patterns could be created in a few different ways. Derek mentioned uh, the resist dyeing of that yellow handkerchief. So that's um, basically putting something onto the material that will resist whatever dye you're using. And then when that material comes off, you're left with the pattern. Most of the printed cotton uh, textiles, and in fact, you can see one of the cotton textiles in the background of the slide that we have up now, were originally uh, block printed, but by the early 19th century and 1830s, 40s that we're talking about here, also roller printing. So for different colors, you might either have a series of blocks giving a part of the pattern with a different color applied, or you might have uh, rollers and you're sending them through rollers uh, to again, apply that pattern. So it's not woven into the material, but it's uh, a pattern that's applied on top with dyes. Our next question is about the boys' skeleton suit. Wondering if they misheard the name. Um, it is in fact called the skeleton suit in the time period. Um, so it is not, it does not mean anything about the child's mortality or anything like that. Um, it is just, that is just a period term for the garment, uh, mm -hmm. which seems like a really, I mean, I would love a skeleton suit for a full grown adult. It seems like a really comfortable garment to wear on a, on a cold winter day. Yeah, um, I don't know if anybody's managed to figure out exactly why there's some theory that it's because it, it does sit very close to your body. And when there's some record, collections of little boys who didn't like wearing it at first because they're used to wearing a gown and they have a lot of freedom of movement, like those little surtouts and the, the loose trousers underneath. But now they're being put into this kind of constricting garment um, that does fit pretty closely to your body. So again, that's one of those period terms we're trying to figure out where it actually comes from. But yeah, you did hear correctly, it was skeleton. <laughs> All right, it looks like we have one more question here. Did men's drawers exist during this period or were they still solely wearing long shirts as an under undergarment? Great question. So I would say, yes, they definitely they definitely exist in the time period. Um, we actually have one pair in our collection that belonged to, um, to a militia officer, actually. We have a lot of his clothing um, and it's actually, a, they're a knit woolen uh, with a linen waistband and they're, they, they appear a lot more like some of the, the slightly later period drawers. Um, the patterns that I've seen, I believe in the Workwoman's Guide, there's even actually a pattern for, for men's drawers and they look more like what you'd imagine breeches in the 18th century where they basically just kind of come to the knee. Um, and they might have ties around the knee to keep them in place. Um, the Fisk ones that we have in the collection here do actually go all the way down to the ankle with ties down there. So they're actually very similar to what you imagine for drawers that come later on in the century. But far and away, I would say most men are probably still just using their shirt, um, their long shirts to actually act as their undergarment. A great question. We I think do there's have... oh, one sorry, more ahead. question um, about the milkweed tippet. Oh, yes. Uh, from right Jennifer over. Jackson. Yep. Is there any information about how to make a milkweed faux fur cape or tippet? It would be amazing to make one of these. You know, that's a great question. I don't believe we do have any instructions um, for making one, but maybe that's something that we can develop. Um, maybe do uh, a future webinar on that or put that up on our website. But we do not have an existing printed pattern, at least that I'm aware of, uh, to make it. Although we have been working on a reproduction in the village for many, many years. Um, and a lot of us have had a chance to actually try our hand at uh, using the milkweed and working on it. Um, but yeah, that's that's a great question. Yeah, that would be great. And we do just have one final comment. It looks like from Martha McKenna. Thank you for bringing your book and OSB collection alive through this wonderful webinar. Thank you, Martha. Uh, again, this is something that we, we really want to do. We want to get back into the world of publications. It had been quite a while since our last book, which is actually a cookbook that we did back around 2009, I believe it was, uh, which really harnessed a lot of the research library collection. And we were so excited to share more of it. Um, again, we'd, we'd love to do so much more. So hopefully there'll be more to come. Stay tuned. All right, well, it looks like we are just about at time here, uh, and it looks like we are done with questions. So I will just remind folks, if you do have any further questions about the webinar, about the book, um, or about any of the garments that are actually featured inside the book, you can reach out to us at the email address here that's included, collections or research at osv.org, and we'll be happy to get back to you with details. Um, and if you are looking for a copy of Needle and Thread, you can either get it by coming here to OSV and buying it either at the Minor Grant store 
inside the museum or if you're just stopping through the area, don't have time to get into the museum, but wanted to stop at the, Oak, the Arks and Yoke uh, Mercantile outside the museum, you can also get a copy there. Um, but you can also call to the gift shop and, and actually reserve a copy that way. So lots of ways for you to get it. Um, we're excited to, uh, to get it into your homes. So <laughs> looks like we have one more question that just popped up. Oh, it was a thank you for the questions. <laughs> All right. Well, with that, thank you all for attending. Um, we're very excited about all the interest in the book. Thank you for all the great questions. Um, and we look forward to seeing you at OSV soon. Take care.